In an attempt to impart scientific legitimacy to creationism, creationists have come up with what they call intelligent design. The idea is that some biological features are too complex to have evolved from a simpler state, because if you remove any single component, the feature no longer functions, and thus the feature must have been created fully formed by a creator. Creationists call this irreducible complexity. So what testable predictions does intelligent design make? Creationists claim that if something can be determined to be irreducibly complex, then that is evidence of a creator. The problem is, there is no way to determine whether something is irreducibly complex. The examples creationists give can be countered by existing species that possess the expected intermediate steps leading up to the feature in question. The human eye is a classic example, with creationists asking, what good is half an eye? Well, it turns out quite a bit. Flatworms only have light-sensitive pigment, but it allows them to detect shadows moving over them. Limpets have their light-sensitive cells in a cup, which allows them to determine the direction of light. Nautiluses have a cup that is almost closed over, which allows the small hole to sharpen the image. Ragworms have a transparent cover over the hole, which protects the interior. Abalones have filled the cup with coagulating fluid, forming a lens that can focus light. And mammals have co-opted muscles around the eye to vary its focus. Each step is an improvement for the individual, and thus something that can be selected for and evolve. Mathematical models show it would take only 1,829 tiny steps over fewer than 400,000 years to achieve an advanced eye from a simple light-sensitive patch of skin. So creationists have moved on to other alleged examples of irreducible complexity, including bacterial flagella, blood clotting, multi-chambered hearts, etc. But in each case, scientists have provided plausible evolutionary explanations that require no supernatural intervention. Sometimes, like the eye example, we find more primitive versions of complex features in other species, indicating that small steps could lead to the evolution of the more complex feature. In other cases, we find features that could have been relatively easily modified from a similar structure originally used for some other purpose. This is called pre-adaptation. Examples include lungs likely evolving from swim bladders that control buoyancy in fish, and bird wings likely evolving from feathered arms used for breeding displays or to keep eggs warm. One of the most significant examples of pre-adaptation is the evolution of bacterial flagella. Creationists have long considered the bacterial flagellum the best example of irreducible complexity because the system could not function if it were missing any of its 42 proteins. However, other bacteria have a structure with several fewer proteins that has a very similar design to the flagellum, but which is used as a syringe to inject poison rather than for locomotion. Only a few incremental mutations would be required to turn the syringe into a flagellum. That's not even the only plausible explanation for how flagella could have evolved, but it is sufficient to disprove the claim that bacterial flagella must be irreducibly complex. Thus, creationists have lost their best evidence for irreducible complexity. Not only that, but in the 2005 Kitzmiller v. Dover case, intelligent design revealed itself to be nothing more than religious-based creationism lacking any scientific merit. The star witness, Michael Behe, was unable to provide any credible evidence to support intelligent design, and he admitted that intelligent design proponents have never conducted even a single experiment that refutes evolution. He also admitted that in order to claim intelligent design is a scientific theory, he had to redefine the word theory in such a way that even astrology would qualify as a scientific theory. The advocates for intelligent design lost the case so badly that the presiding judge, who was a conservative Republican, by the way, excoriated them for deliberately lying to the court and for the breathtaking inanity of their arguments. After the trial, another leading advocate of intelligent design, William Dembski, predicted there would be much stronger evidence of intelligent design within five to ten years. That was a dozen years ago, and intelligent design has still not provided any compelling evidence to support it. Intelligent design failed to make its case for being scientific 
But that does not mean one can't make some predictions about what one would expect to see in biological systems designed by an intelligent creator. For instance, if an all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect God created all life basically in its current forms, then we would not expect to see inefficient, clunky, and problematic, unintelligent design. Evolution, on the other hand, has to work with whatever is available, so we would expect to see a lot of inefficiency and workarounds in design. So what do we see in nature? Exactly what evolutionary theory predicts. The eyes of all vertebrates, for example, require light to travel through a slightly obscuring thin tissue and blood supply to reach the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are also inefficiently oriented backward, and the result is an optic blind spot in the middle of our vision. Cephalopods, like octopi and squid, don't have this backward orientation, so it's clear the backward design isn't necessary for good vision. Other examples include the urethra, which is routed through the prostate, making it prone to infection and swelling with age. But this makes sense if the prostate evolved from tissues in the walls of the urethra. Humans give birth through the pelvis instead of through the lower abdomen, resulting in unnecessary pain, injury, and other complications. But it's what we would expect to see if live birth evolved from a system that originally passed much smaller eggs through the pelvis with ease. And sometimes a human egg will slip through the small space between the ovary and the fallopian tube, resulting in an abdominal pregnancy that without surgery is almost always fatal to both fetus and mother. But this imperfect connection makes sense if it evolved as an add-on adaptation for live birth in mammals. Probably the most profound evidence of unintelligent design is the recurrent laryngeal nerve found in all vertebrates with necks. It's a nerve that basically connects the brain to the larynx, a journey that in humans should be just a few inches. However, the nerve instead travels down the neck, loops around the aorta, and travels back up the neck to the larynx, adding three feet to the distance. In giraffes, the nerve is 15 feet longer than the direct route, and in the extinct Supersaurus, the nerve would have been 100 feet longer than the direct route. Not only is this inefficient, but it makes the nerve more vulnerable to injury. This makes sense in evolutionary terms if the recurrent laryngeal nerve evolved from gill arches in our fish ancestors, and it happened to start out in an inconvenient position for natural selection to act upon. Evolutionarily, there's simply no way the nerve could just avoid looping around the aorta. These are only a few examples of unintelligent design, but all of them make sense in the light of evolution, where natural selection can only act upon the structures that are available, and none of them make sense in the context of a perfect designer easily capable of avoiding such design problems. Another problem related to unintelligent design is the existence of vestigial organs. These are features that no longer perform their original function, such as wings that are no longer capable of flight. Sometimes vestigial organs are pre-adapted for other purposes that natural selection can act upon, such as ostriches co-opting their vestigial wings for mating displays, and flightless cormorants using their vestigial wings to improve swimming agility, whereas other vestigial wings, like the kiwis, are completely useless. Additional examples of mostly or completely useless vestigial features include male nipples, the human tailbone, our goosebumps response to cold or fear, hind leg bones in whales, blind eyes in cave fish, and so on. Evolutionary theory predicts the existence of vestigial organs because as a population evolves into different species to survive in different environments, parts of their old anatomy are no longer needed. They take up valuable metabolic resources and are thus gradually selected against. From the perspective of creationism's perfect creator, however, what would be the point of having a species develop organs that serve no purpose? Creating blind cave fish with useless eyes is pointlessly inefficient and thus evidence against creationism. Related to vestigial organs is the existence of atavisms. These are dead genes that occasionally mutate and switch back on, resulting in an individual growing a feature no longer expressed by typical members of the species. For example, one in 500 whales is born with external rear leg remnants, sometimes even possessing feet and toes. Horses have only one toe per leg, 
but occasionally some are born with up to three toes, just like their extinct relatives. Sometimes humans are born with functioning tails, just like monkeys. It's even possible to cause chickens to develop teeth-like structures by providing a single missing protein to otherwise dead genes. These degenerating leftover genes are what we might expect to find if whales evolved from a land mammal, horses evolved from a three-toed ancestor, humans evolved from a tailed primate, and birds evolved from dinosaurs with teeth. But what sense do they make if all species were instead unique creations by a perfect god? Further related evidence of baggage inherited from our ancient ancestry can be found in embryology. For instance, the embryos of four-legged land animals form hind limb buds that develop into rear legs. Whale embryos also form those same hind limb buds, but they are reabsorbed before birth. Baleen whales lack teeth, but their embryos develop teeth which are also reabsorbed before birth. Both whales and humans lack a coat of fur, yet their fetuses develop a full coat of fur which is, once again, reabsorbed before birth. Human embryos also develop tails and an empty yolk sac that disappear as the pregnancy progresses. And like all mammal embryos, human embryos develop fish-like gill arches that turn into different structures in the ear, eustachian tubes, carotid artery, tonsils, larynx, and cranial nerves. Additionally, our circulatory system, kidneys, and vertebrae closely resemble those in fish embryos initially, but then alter considerably to become amphibian-like, then reptile-like, before finally developing into a mammalian system. Reptiles also go through the fish-like and amphibian-like stages before developing into the reptilian form, but they don't go through the mammalian stage. Evolutionarily, this makes sense because mammals evolved after reptiles, and embryos develop using the processes inherited from their ancestors. Creationism has nothing to account for any of this.